I ever love a fictional character as much as I love Baz Pitch? Hello everybody, it is Katie here. So, as you may already know, I love Carry On. Carry On by Rainbow Rowell is arguably my favourite book of all time? Arguably. I mean, I'm, I'm really not good at picking favourites. Whenever anybody asks me for my favourite anything, I just sweat. I, life's too short to have one favourite. You've got to have a whole list. But, but Carry On is up there. It, it's, it's on the top shelf. My story with Carry On is quite interesting. Fangirl is one of my favourite contemporaries of all time. It, it, I just relate to it on so many levels. I'm not going to talk about how much I love Fangirl, otherwise we'll be here all day! But I completely fell in love with that book when I first read it. I love Rainbow's writing style. But when Carry On was first announced, I, I really wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. Because when I read Fangirl, I, I wasn't too interested in the Simon Snow story. So I genuinely didn't know if it was going to be something that I'd like, but then I got the book and the rest is history. Baz Pitch took over my entire life. I have a lot of fictional characters that I love. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But reading Wayward Son really reiterated to me how much I really love Baz. He is one of my favorite characters of all time. And I, I don't even, know why. If he was a real person, I'd probably hate him. We just would not get along at all. But in terms of fiction, uh, he's just brilliant. So yeah, that's how I ended up loving Carry On as much as I do now. It's all thanks to Baz Pitch. So Carry On is one of my favourite books. We went years without a sequel and then all of a sudden <laughs> a sequel was announced. I lost my shit. I nearly made a video at the time, but there was a lot going on in my life, so I just didn't have time. I don't know what that video would include other than me just screaming for 10 minutes over the fact that we were getting more content. So I was majorly excited for this book. But then in the weeks leading up to actually being released, I was worried because it suddenly hit me that it, it, it was a sequel and a lot of the reasons why I loved Carry On weren't going to be a thing in the sequel. In case you didn't know, I really love the enemies to lovers trope and a big part of Carry On was Simon and Baz hating each other but actually loving each other and then being roommates and them learning how to be a team and it, it was that that I fell in love with about Carry On. So when I actually got my hands on the sequel I, I was worried that I wasn't going to love it as much as I loved the first book. The level of stress that I had because there is nothing worse than having your favourite book torn to pieces by a sequel. It just... yeah, so that was my biggest fear going into this. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. It, w it was completely different to carry on, but I still loved it in its own way. It, of course it didn't disappoint because Baz is in it, so it could never disappoint. But yeah, I was really worried in the run up to the release. So I will briefly give a little overview of my thoughts for those of you who haven't read the book and don't want to be spoiled. And then I'm gonna ask you to leave so I can discuss. So I have the very pretty Warpstones edition of this book that was sent to me by my lovely friend Jasmine. And thank God for her, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to read this on its release day. So she's an angel. Thank you, Jasmine. So without spoiling anything, this did feel like a middle book. On the day that it was released in the UK, we found out that there was going to be a book three, but obviously people in America that have been able to read it a couple of weeks before we got it over here knew that it ended on a cliffhanger. That, I mean, that's not really a spoiler now that we know there's going to be a third book. So yeah, it does read like a middle book and it leaves you with more questions than it does answers. So I'm kind of glad that I knew going into it that there was going to be another one. I've spent all this time since the announcement of Wayward Son thinking that we were going to get all these answers about Simon's parents and, y you know, the mage and just everything and this book gives you absolutely none of that. <laughs> so I'm very glad that we're getting the book three because I still want my answers. Going back to what I said earlier about wondering whether or not I was going to like it, I will say that the first few chapters felt really weird to me. Not in a bad way, it was just weird to get new content and to see these characters 
further on in their lives from where we left them at the end to carry on. And it was so strange to not have them at Watford, to have them trying, and in Simon's case, failing to get their lives back on track. Reading this made me realise exactly how much I had missed these characters though. I will say that I did miss Watford, but on the other hand, I really loved the road trip across America because I had no idea what to expect. Like, at least with Watford, we had some sort of structure, whereas in this, you just don't know what's going to happen, where they're going to end up, and that's such a good aspect of this story. And also we get to see the American side of magic which is a lot different to what I expected it to be. So yeah, that side of the story was really interesting to learn about. Also reading this, you know, it didn't even occur to me beforehand that we could potentially get new main characters. I, I don't know why I didn't think about that, but we do. And I absolutely love the characters that this book introduced. I liked getting narration from somebody else that we didn't see in the first book. So yeah, there are so many things to love about this book. That's all I can think of really to say without going into spoilers. I'm not good at summarising books, I'm, I'm really not. For somebody who has been reviewing books for eight years now, I'm really no good at it. So if you haven't read this book yet, then please turn off this video now because I'm going to discuss everything. Bye! Okay, so to everyone who has read this book, how much do you love it? Because I love it lots. So let's start by talking about Simon. Because I did see some people say that they would disappointed with how Simon acted in this book. What were they expecting? Were they just thinking that this was going to be a cute and wonderful book with Simon and Baz happily in love and it was all great and rosy? No! Simon's been through some shit! Simon in this book is exactly what you would expect from a character who has been through as much as he has. It was a great realistic portrayal of somebody who has been through such emotional trauma. But in saying that, it was also painful as hell to read him like that, especially those first few chapters where you can tell he just doesn't have any direction in his life. He's at home most of the time, he's drinking on the couch, he's just not interested in anything. His relationship with Baz is suffering because of it and he's blaming himself. And it's horrible! Like, those first few chapters were brutal because they are my babies and they're going through so much pain and I hate it. But I'm very glad that Rainbow wrote it that way because, you know, I hate books that don't deal with that sort of stuff. I know it's not pleasant to read, but you have to stay true to what it would be like if that happened in reality. I mean, if I'd have gone through what Simon went through, I'd be ten times worse. I don't think I'd ever leave the house again, ever. So the worst part about those few chapters was Simon feeling like he wasn't living up to his expectations when it came to Baz. He feels like he's dragging Baz down. He wants to break up with him so that Baz doesn't have to. He just feels like a burden. And oh my God, the way that hit me. Because on the other hand, you have Baz knowing that there's something wrong with Simon and not knowing how to approach it. So Simon throughout this book is trying to deal with his past and is trying to move on. And I feel like the trip to America, it, it doesn't really solve anything in the long term, but it distracts him momentarily. I will say that his and Baz's relationship left me on edge throughout this book, because the moments where they were happy together, you were reminded that it is just temporary. They still don't really know what's going to happen and how to deal with everything. But just for a few moments, that goes away and they just get to be with each other. But, you, but it's always there. So I could never really relax. <laughs> so let's talk about Baz. Have I mentioned how much I love Baz? I, you know, I didn't think it was possible for this book to make me love him more. And yet here we are. It was very strange having him in the story from the very beginning, because obviously in Carry On, it took us like 150 odd pages to get introduced to him. Whereas in this book, we just get his narration from the very start. And that makes me happy because his narration is hilarious. <laughs> my favorite chapters in this book are from his perspective. His list of things that he hates. Oh my God, I was in tears laughing over that list. It just, I love his attitude. I love his language. 
I love how much he's just generally a grumpy person. <laughs> but also what I loved about him in this book is how much of a wonderful boyfriend he is and how much of a genuinely good person he is. Because Baz is that type of character that's stereotypically supposed to be evil. That's one of the things that I loved most about Carry On, is that it challenges who is right and wrong. It takes the character that is supposed to be the villain and goes into his personality. We explore what he's actually about. So that's why Baz is such a wonderful character to me, because despite being the stereotypical evil guy in a book, he's actually just so nice. And the way that he cares about Simon, and the way he just wants what's best for him. It, it was just, it was weird seeing him not be as much of a uh, little shit in this one. <laughs> because like in Carry On he would pick fights with Simon for no reason. Whereas in this one he is more of just like a caring mother. <laughs> so it was quite weird to see that shift in him. I feel like he spent half of this book looking after Simon and Penny. Okay, so literally one of the things I loved the absolute most about this book is the friendship between Baz and Penny because we didn't really get to see much of them in Carry On because the main focus was on Simon and Baz whereas in this book they have spent a year being friends. There's a whole year's worth of content that we haven't seen. We've only got glimpses into what their everyday life was like, but you can immediately tell how much closer they all are in this book. And his friendship with Penny is just the purest thing. He's the one that goes over and gives her a hug when she ends up breaking up with Mika. They're the ones always sharing a bed when there is only one available bed. <laughs> they are such a team in this book and I enjoyed getting to see their relationship so much. The thing that broke my heart the most about Baz in this book is him trying to learn more about who he is. In Britain, vampires are completely different to what vampires are in America. So Baz has spent his whole life thinking that he's trapped in a certain way of life. And this trip to America just shows him how wrong he is and how different his life could be. And I think that's why he ends up trusting Lamb so much because he sees a character who seems to have achieved everything. He has such a normal life despite being a vampire and that's something that Baz could never comprehend. He never even questioned it, he just accepted the way his life was going to be. And Lamb changes all of that. Don't get me started on Lamb because at first I didn't trust him. And then I wanted to trust him so much that I did trust him completely. Especially during that scene where Baz has dinner with him and He's showing Baz how to keep his fangs in. That's such a big part of Baz's character, is that he, he never eats around people because it makes him uncomfortable when his fangs appear. And he's always so embarrassed by those parts of him, the vampire parts that he doesn't have control of. And so for this guy to show up and teach him that there are ways to get around all these things that he's been scared of his whole life. In that moment during the dinner when Baz was getting emotional, I was getting emotional and I completely trusted Lam at that point. But, but then it all went to shit again and y y it's just so frustrating because Lam is the type of character that Baz needs. Like he really needs somebody to help him overcome all of these obstacles that he's felt like he's been trapped by his whole life by being a vampire. And Lamb can help him through all that, but then Lamb can also be an absolute piece of shit. And I can't forgive him for betraying Baz in the way he did, even if he did do it for Baz's sake. So yeah, Lamb was a really interesting part of the story, but I'm, I'm not going to make the mistake of trusting him again. I will say that some of my favourite scenes happened courtesy of Lamb. For example, Invisible Simon being a jealous boyfriend <laughs> when they follow Baz to Lamb's house. Yeah, those, those scenes are hilarious. <laughs> and I like that Simon got so jealous about that because, you know, he spends the majority of the book trying to face the fact that he feels like he needs to break up with Baz. But, you know, in those moments, you see that he, he really does love him to the point that he will take down the whole world to protect Baz. So yeah, what I also liked about that is that Simon had no hesitation in saying that he was Baz's boyfriend, even if it took competition in the form of Lamb to bring that side of him out. Because at the start of the story, when they're in the airport together, I think it is, Baz mentions the other people's stairs 
get to Simon a lot. With them being a normal couple and d doing what couples get to do, like holding hands and just being affectionate in public. You know, we know that people still do act like pieces of shit to same-sex couples in public. Even if they're not directly saying anything, it's the looks that people can get sometimes. And I like the the story pointed out that that does stir Simon up a little bit, makes him uncomfortable to the point that he doesn't really treat Baz like a boyfriend in public. But then when Lam appears, <laughs> straight away Simon's like, I'm the boyfriend! And also the scene with the goat <laughs> when they end up in the quiet zone and we first meet Shepard. That whole scene still confuses me a little bit. There's so much about American magic that we don't know. But we get my favourite line in the book from that. I'll be damned and drawn and fucking quartered before I let some deaf like goat feel up my boyfriend right in front of me. I remember Rainbow posting that line before the book was released and I just wanted to know what the fuck that was about. So. <laughs> I was very happy to find out what was going on in that scene when I actually read the book. So again, it's moments like that that bring out Simon's true feelings for Baz. Let's talk about Penny in this book because poor Penny goes through a lot. I made the mistake of thinking, like Simon, that Penny and Mika were set for life. I thought that in this book, you know, Mika would join the gang and we get to properly meet him but no turns out he's he's not really a very nice guy him having a pop of penny for not listening to him and that he wanted to break up but she didn't give him a chance to i mean i can understand that but you know she has been through a lot you know you can't just pin all the blame on penny there are two people in this relationship at the end of the day he made mistakes as well, he should have been more clear. While he did have valid points, it was wrong of him to just pin all of the blame on Penny, given what she's been through. But the scene where Penny goes to talk to Mika, I, she ends up holding the Pomeranian and then walks off with the Pomeranian. That scene was so fucking funny, honestly. We got some comedy gold moments in this book, I am telling you now. Baz teaching Simon how to drive whilst Penny was speaking to Mika was also hilarious. I love those scenes because they did give us more of a look into what Simon and Baz are like with each other day to day. But yeah, poor Penny ends up breaking up with Mika and kinda doesn't know where to go from there because she and everyone else thought that she'd marry Mika and that'd be that. So she's confused in this book. I feel like she really needs a direction as well. And this whole trip is down to her because she wants to go and check on Agatha. Whereas as much as she does care for Agatha, I also feel like that was kind of just an excuse because I feel like she needed to go somewhere. Not just to talk to Mika, but she just needed to do something. And Agatha not replying to her was the perfect excuse for her to take that step. Of course, it gets them into a whole load of mess, but you know, they learn things along the way. And then Agatha, oh my god, poor Agatha. She really can't escape the world of magic, can she? I will say that I have such a newfound appreciation for Agatha in this book. I think the first time I read Carry On, I didn't really enjoy her character that much, but then the times that I reread Carry On, I started to love her more and more with each reread because you, you pay more attention to what she's feeling. And I can understand her struggle to want to get away from this world that she's been forced into because she didn't really have a choice. So I have a lot more appreciation for her character now. I, I feel like she was just fantastic in Wayward Son. She just says it like it is. She takes no bullshit. And it's hilarious. She's just fed up of being dragged into every fucking magical mess that there is. And part of her still resents Simon for always being there as well, even when he shows up at the end. She's like, of course he would. Of course. I love the way she talks about how somebody like her could never save the day, that she's always there to make more of a mess of things and end up the typical damsel in distress. And then she takes action and actually helps them get out of that whole showdown with the vampires. So she's a fucking badass character in this book. Speaking of these vampires, let's talk about Next Blood and Brayden. Like I said, I didn't really know what to expect from this book. This definitely wasn't it. I did not think that the plot would revolve around this idiotic group of people that think 
they can attain the highest level by being vampires with magic. There are always dickheads like Raiden in life. People who think they are above everyone. They're the type of people I hate the most. So Agatha never once falls for the whole situation. When she's following her friend Ginger to this, like, it's like a camp that they have to level up, attain the next level of life. She never falls for it, she thinks it's a load of crap and, you know, she's right, she just doesn't realise how bad it actually is. They all turn out to be these vampires that experiment on people with magic to try and find a way to extract their magic. We think Lamb and the actual vampires are against them, but it turns out they've just got an agreement and it's all one big annoying mess. So the next blood was kind of a pleasant surprise in terms of plot because genuinely I thought that this book would be Simon getting some answers, especially because Lucy went off to America. Supposedly that was the rumour, we don't know whether she actually did or not, but I thought that maybe he was going to find some sort of connection to his parents in America and that's what the plot was going to revolve around. I didn't expect Next Blood and the vampires to be such a big plot, but I am glad because it, it's connecting the story more to Baz. And because of this, we got to learn a lot more about vampires, but we also end up with more questions as well. I, I am quite curious to see how Next Blood is going to be tied into the story in this third book where obviously they go back to Britain because something's going on at Watford. So, you know, we've got to deal with them trying to become superior beings as well as getting answers for everything else that happened in the first book that we need to wrap up. So, you know, this third book's gonna have a lot to deal with. Let's talk about Shepard, our new character. At first, again, I didn't know whether I was going to trust him, but I actually really enjoyed his character in the end. I kind of knew that he was going to be a main character when he got a narration part. You know, that's how you can tell. I didn't realise that he was going to be cursed. I didn't think he was actually tied into this world some way, which was a good plot twist because I didn't really suspect anything like that. I think he's a fantastic character. He's a smooth talker and he has all these connections and I like how many times he managed to save the day. He just seems like a very happy-go-lucky guy. Even when things go to shit, he's just like, let's roll with it. I am excited to see more of him in the next book. It's nice having a new main character. We've been so used to the trio. Now we've got Shepard and I, I think we're probably going to have Agatha as more of a main character in this third book because she's kind of realised that she can't get away from magic. So she's been dragged in yet again. And I hope so anyway, because she deserves more of a story. So yeah, that ending, the cliffhanger at the end is that something's happening at Watford. And Penny was very shook up about it. She gets a call at the very end. Who knows what it is? Like I said, this book gives us more questions than answers. So yeah, I still have lots of questions about Next Blood. And then I still have lots of questions the tie over from the first book. All I know is that I can't wait to get back to these characters. Things that I want from this next book, which I'm assuming is going to be the final book and that, you know, have it as a trilogy and wrap it up. I really think Baz needs to accept who he is. He's dealing with being a vampire in his own way, but he's not really living. So I think he needs to properly accept it and I think we, we need to have a scene with him and his family. They need to talk about Baz being a vampire because it's just something that they never do and I feel like when that happens it'll help Baz move on with his life. The other thing that I completely forgot to mention when I was talking about Simon is how this book deals with him no longer having magic because that's been a part of his life for the longest time and now he's suddenly without it and he feels like he's not as much use as he was and even though he's no longer got magic he's still not even a normal person because he has wings so I am interested to see what's the end game for Simon I don't think he needs his magic back I, I, do, I don't know I really don't know where the story is going overall 
and I'm also dumb so I'm not good at coming up with theories like everyone else is. If you have wonderful theories then please feel free to share them in the comments because I like to read other people's theories, I just can't think of them myself. The other thing we really need from this final book is for Simon and Baz to learn how to talk. That's the biggest thing standing in their way at the moment is that they don't know how to communicate and so they need to learn how to talk effectively to help them get over their problems. Please! <laughs> I also hope that you know, Penny gets some sort of direction in her life and figures out what it is that she really wants because, you know, we don't actually know. What are her goals? What does she want to do? There's just, there's so many things that I hope we get for these characters. What I forgot to mention earlier as well is how much I absolutely love the age of these characters. They're all late teens and early twenties and in YA we tend to get characters who were around 16, 17. But when I think of young adults, I think of anyone from around the age of 15 to mid-twenties. YA only tends to focus on the younger side of that. No one ever really caters to people who are university age. And I know that when I was in university, all I wanted was to read some good books about people who were my age and people who had my concerns. The only thing we really had was new adult, but new adult was a genre that had so much potential and yet it, it turned into people just writing smut stories. I wanted to be reading about people in their early 20s who didn't know what the fuck they were doing because you know that was me. So I'm really glad that this is a fantasy story but it's still got characters who are in their late teens and early 20s whose plans in life have completely gone to shit, they don't know what they're doing, they've got no direction, and that's what I really loved about Wayward Son. We need more YA books that have characters of this age. So overall, it was a very, very different book from Carry On. Like, it felt completely different, but also not in a bad way. I loved getting to see the characters in a new environment, and we got to learn a lot more about them. I think we got to learn a lot more about the world as well, because in Carry On there wasn't really enough time to fully delve into the world of magic. I, I, I don't think I loved it as much as Carry On. I don't think I can love anything as much as I loved Carry On, but I did love the characters more. So yeah, I, I can't quite believe that I am filming a discussion video for Wayward Son, that it's actually out there. We have new content. We have something else to look forward to. I just need a release date now, please. Please. So please do let me know all of your thoughts and feelings on Wayward Son. Did it live up to your expectations? I hope it didn't disappoint you, but if it did, tell me why. I have seen quite a few mixed reactions actually. You know, there are people who didn't really like it as much as they thought they would. But I think that's always the way with middle books. It's very rare for a middle book to be exceptional. I think the only time where I've loved a middle book in a trilogy more than any of the others is with Catching Fire. That was just god tier, I don't know why. I preferred Catching Fire to Mockingjay, but, but that's the only other time. Normally with trilogies I find the middle book less exciting to the first and last. So the people who didn't enjoy this one it might just be middle book syndrome. The last one hopefully will fulfill all of your expectations. So yeah, leave me all of your thoughts in the comments. I hope you guys enjoyed this mess of a video. I, I definitely forgot to mention so many things. One day I will learn how to film reviews properly. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye! If you are wondering why I have nail varnish on one thumbnail, none of the others by the way, it's because I had to take some nice bookstagram pictures. I couldn't be bothered painting all of my nails and the only one that you could see in the pictures was the thumbnail. So I just painted my thumb because I'm lazy. Thank you.